All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to our CFN webinar series. Today we are uh, presenting described care received by frail elderly patients nearing end of life in Canada by Professor Anique Jaguer. Just to let you know, the webinars and slides will be posted on the website, as you can see. Um, uh, I don't think we actually have the um, place where it's at, but it should be easy to find and it should be up in two days. Just for an update on the network, we're currently completing our renewal for the next five years and we're looking for follow-up with emails and such that we sent out uh, regarding our fellowship and summer student program. Uh, if anybody's interested, please give Jackie or Carol a call or our emails here as well, and we'd be happy to run you through the process and what it means and what we're looking for. At the end of the session today, we will have <coughs> a so please submit your questions online during the presentation, and we'll try to get it to as many as possible. Um, and and Ichigar has said that she will provide her email address at the end. Uh, if we don't get to some of the questions, then you can follow up with her directly. But we're hoping to answer as many questions as possible today so we can share with the audience. So without further ado, I will um, introduce Professor Anique Chaguer. She's a scientist at the Quebec Center for Excellence in Aging. She's with the Department of Family and Emergency Medicine at Laval University. She's a certified trainer of the Cochrane Collaboration for the Training of Systematic Review. She obtained a doctorate in biology at INRS in Quebec City, followed by a postdoc training at Laval University and McMaster University. And you can actually see her today. So go ahead, Anique. So do you see me now? Yes, I do. Okay, well, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to present today the work that we conducted last year on the, this to draw a portrait of the care received by frail senior nearing end of life in Canada. So this work uh, is an environmental scan. I don't know if you, many of you are uh, familiar with this kind of methodology. Uh, the scan enables the decision maker to uh, understand the external environment and translate this understanding into the institution's planning and decision making process. And so um, it's, it's really to help decision making. We had three research questions we investigated. What are the healthcare services and models of care currently offered in Canada for frail seniors? How are the how are the healthcare resources used, and what are the major outcomes of care? So this research was funded by the Canadian Frailty Network, and it comprises uh, three data sources. So we have first a scoping and literature review, uh, which we synthesized and reported. Then we have administrative data, where we derived uh, resource and resource utilization and outcomes. Again, we did some synthesis and report. And uh, using these two data sources, uh, we, we did some uh, summaries and presented the results to stakeholders. Uh, in the interviews with stakeholders, we also asked them broader questions about uh, to, to answer our three objectives. In the end, we integrated all of these data sources into one single analysis. The team uh, was composed of the people from five provinces, uh, knowledge users from hospice care management services, government, hospital services management, and we collaborated with a number of data holders. So all the provinces are covered in this, there, there's not, the, um, so there was a, for the data, administrative data, where there was a new data pool for four of the five provinces, and we use existing databases for um, Nova Scotia. So 
I'm going to present first the methods and some results for each data sources, source, but I decided to focus more on the re integrated results. So uh, I'm really going to go very fast on the, the specific results of each of the uh, data source. So you, I would like to underline that this work is going to lead to several scientific papers, maybe like six. So it's very, very large and it's a challenge to present everything. So I will be very uh, happy to answer any questions you might have on the specific aspect, one aspect or the other. I think it's a good place to start. The, the scan is a good place to start for any, any researcher interested in trans seniors. So it's like a, a, a first um, scan. It's a scan, so it, it, I would be very pleased that uh, you can use all the data. So then, in the second part, I'm going to I'm going to check with you what the results are when you integrate the sources uh, in relation to the three objectives, models of care and novel interventions in Canada, frail seniors' healthcare outcomes, and outcomes across frail senior cohorts. So let's look first at the methods and uh, uh, quick results for each data source. First, the scoping literature review. So this uh, review was done in academic and grade literature. It was a highly specific search strategy. And we included all uh, reports about frail seniors, their caregivers, and healthcare providers, reports about clinical quality indicators, and studies, all studies that were performed in Canada. They had to be in English or English. It's important to point that we only included reports published in 2009 and later because this, the, we, don't, we don't present the, the results, early results. So it was a challenge to identify reports about frail seniors. So there was a big work done to, to clarify that. So first, it's obvious when uh, the, the researcher of the report mentioned that they had studied frail seniors, the report was included. But we also included reports about seniors that could be classified as frail using a description in the report. And we based our definitions on the CHSA clinical frailty scale and the Edmonton frail scale. So using these scales, we developed the definition of what would be included and excluded. We also included all reports about seniors who were living in long-term care facilities or were at the end of life. So here you have the flow charts of the, the reports uh, that we screen. So in the end, we included 93 uh, reports. 22 of these focused on the impact of an intervention. 35 only described an intervention, but did not really test any aspect of it in an experimental design. But we were interested to see what's out there in terms of proposition for new, novel, interesting interventions. We then also included studies comparing quality of care across different cohorts. And uh, some of the two other categories also included uh, some comparisons sometimes about uh, comparisons of patient cohorts, and they were treated with the third category of patient cohorts. So I just want to show you a bit the breakdown of the studies on the impact of an intervention because we're always interested by experimental studies. And so here you see the, the frequency by intervention categories. So we use some categories of the Cochrane Collaboration uh, Effective Practice and Organization of Care Group. So we uh, categorize interventions into health intervention, prevention, treatment, screening. So the the, the, the more numerous uh, interventions were prevention interventions. You see there are 11 among the 20. We also had three professional interventions, six organizational interventions that targeted an, a change in, in the organizational structure, and one regulatory intervention. So this, this is uh, what I'm going to, I'm not going to present more right now just on the review. Um, we have, a, we have a tables on, on, on the effectiveness. We compared the, the, the indicators for all the 
different types of intervention, and, and I would be pleased to share these with you if you're interested. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about what, uh, at what we did for administrative data and uh, synthesis. So, uh, the first, again, the first challenge was to identify uh, or extract a cohort of frail seniors. And then when we started, there were, we didn't find any, um, any uh, algorithm that we could use that would be usable into all the provinces. So we define new identification rules. It's not a real algorithm. It wasn't validated. Uh, we think it's uh, so. It's based on clinical indices to identify frail seniors, the two same that I mentioned earlier. So the Dr. Rockwood's um, uh, Canadian Health Study on Aging and uh, Edmonton Frail Scale. We submitted our initial rules to experts, geriatrician and researchers. And then uh, we also uh, looked at the literature from the scoping review where some form of claim-based data was used and we tried to see how they define frail. And then we also used markers from population-based work that may be translated into service utilization by frail seniors. So we aim to get a specific set of uh, seniors. The specificity of each rule to really identify our target population. So it's probably prob it's probable that we missed a lot of frail seniors, but we think that the people that we have in the cohort are really frail. So the first rule was long-term care residents. So we included uh, long-term care residents or people who were terminally ill or who had at least two of the uh, following health uh, issues, so cognitive impairment, general health status. In, uh, so the, these general health status, um, um, I don't have them at hand, no. so I'm just uh, going to leave it at that for now. Incontinence, falls, nutritional status, and we also uh, targeted specific service utilization, such as geriatrician billings, provider home visit, and provider visit to hospice. So this is just an example of the cohorts we have in Ontario and Quebec. So in Ontario, we started off with 72,000 people, in Quebec, 47,000. Uh, so you can see of these that we have 43% in Ontario that were long-term care residents and that were included in the cohort. In Quebec, you see it's a bit different, so 25%. 21% in Ontario were terminally ill, and 15% were uh, in Quebec. For uh, using the Edmonton Frail Scale or service utilization, so you need to have two domains or more for these, uh, we have 31% of the people of the initial core that were uh, frail, and 37 in the Quebec core. In total, you see that 68% of the initial cohort was frail and 58% was frail in Quebec. I want to point that, that it's very difficult to compare provinces. Well, I mean, we even, I, I would like to be even a bit more strong uh, and say that we cannot compare uh, the provinces because of the difference in, differences in the cohorts. So you see here that they're, they're not from the same origin. Because later I'm going to present indicators of quality of life and uh, of quality uh, of care, and I don't. I want to make sure that people don't compare provinces. For instance, uh, the Nova Scotia cohort that we have is um, only cancer patients. So this one is a bit special. Uh, we we couldn't get uh, new extract, couldn't extract new data in the time that we had. So we used existing uh, databases of people with cancer. So this one is really, truly different. But uh, in the other uh, provinces, there are also differences that, that prevent us from comparing the, the cohorts. Uh, for example, um, the dates are not exactly the same. In Nova Scotia, we have 2004 to 2009 people who had died between 2004 and 2009. In BC, we have people from 2009 to 2014. Um, also, 
There might be variation in claims data as a result in different billing practices across institutions and provinces. For example, there are more positions on alternative payment plan in some areas than in others. In addition, some provinces use diagnoses or procedure more often than others. So you can see here between uh, uh, Ontario and Quebec, it could be that uh, there are more people with nutrition issue in Quebec, but it also could be that this is more often diagnosed in Quebec. So because of that, I just wanted to uh, speak a bit about this. For this work, we asked the, the panel of researchers to prioritize clinical quality indicator because uh, we couldn't extract everything. So we started with 45 indicators that had been studied in Nova Scotia. And uh, we submitted it to uh, the panel of the uh, researcher. Uh, well, the first step was to see what can, could be really extracted in the time that we had in the databases that we had. And then we asked the team to select to select six. So these are the six indicators that was uh, and their rank. So the first indicator was the number of hospital deaths in the last year of, of life. Second was the rate of emergency department visits in the last year of life. And the four last ones were uh, also uh, prioritized, well, equally important uh, by, were judged as equally important. So the proportion of frail seniors who have undergone non-beneficial intervention number of intensive care units and mission in the last year of life, family physician continuity of care, and rate of hospital readmission in the last year of life. So this was done prior uh, to anything else. So the interviews now, uh, we had the participants that were patients or caregivers, uh, health care professionals, and 16 decision makers. So you see we had, people, we had people from five provinces that came from various settings of care. The general objectives of the interviews were to explore the views of the quality of current care and, the, and services available and potential improvements and to prioritize clinical quality in for frail seniors. So we did a prioritization uh, work for administrative data with researchers but now we wanted to broaden this to stakeholders and ask them among all the potential indicators what could be important to them. So um, we listed 36 clinical quality indicators from the review work and administrative data study. And our participants selected these four as most important. Increasing patient quality of life was rated the was the most, so we asked them, is this a good measure of clinical quality of care? And they, they rated from one to five. So quality of life was rated as the most important, followed by increasing providers' competency, skills, or knowledge, reducing symptoms, and reducing caregiver burden. So I think more than four could be uh, taken out of our work, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on these four uh, because of the time. So now we're going to check uh, what the, the what happens when we integrate the results. So the first question is to have an idea of what are the current models of care in Canada. In this, uh, in the interview, it was one of the main themes discussed was discussed by 20 over the 42 participants. The teams more frequently discussed, so we asked them problems and potential improvements. So for problems, they said that, the, that this was the most often um, uh, common. So the, the, the system lacked like a holistic approach to assess the needs of frail seniors. And the suggestion that was most often made was to improve patient-centered care. Notably, uh, to have a more holistic approach, more personalized approach, and increasing collaboration between healthcare providers to, uh, to involve frail seniors. So I found a citation that was, that's really perfect so to portray uh, this aspect. So the question we asked them is, 
one of the questions is, imagine a future 10 years from now where Nova Scotia is well organized to care adequately for frail seniors. What future looks like to you? So here is one answer a, a healthcare provider gave us. You'd have a system, so I'm sorry for my English, <laughs> so you'd have a system in which frailty was sort of recognized as a significant determinant of the health and that it was openly discussed with patients. We know that the they were becoming frail or family members were low. We'd be discussing the same way that we discuss cancer or dementia or diabetes. So people enlisted as their medical problems understand how it influenced their future planning and their prognosis. It would form a routine part of assessment in the healthcare system where you're seeing a family doctor or you're seeing a specialist and care would be tailored according to your overall health status. There would be supports in place matched to your frailty levels so that you have community support in same in hospital. Your care experience would be sort of tailored to your frailty level and your specific needs. It would be openly discussed. The assessment would be an important part of the routine assessment and the care planning and actual care delivery would be aligned with frailty. Now if we check, uh, if we look at the published study on the current models of care in Canada and uh, I would like to check the six interventions that were done uh, to improve the organization of services. So here you have the six, on the left hand side you have the six intervention. On the right you have the clinical quality indicator that they aim to improve. So you can see that overall these interventions were, all they all add uh, positive impacts on important uh, quality indicators. So you see uh, the first one, the PRISMA study that was done in Quebec, it's a coordination type integrated service delivery model. Uh, it uh, increased burden, but it improved patient empowerment, empowerment, patient satisfaction with care, physical performance, unmet need, number of medical visits, and increased emergency department use and increased hospital use. The video study that was done in Ontario was, allowed, uh, was able to improve competency, knowledge, and skills of providers. Uh, the care for senior model, it's an innovative model to improve care coordination and integration between specialists and acute care resources in Ontario. So you see again, so I, I don't want to go through all of them, but you see that uh, these interventions seem to answer some of the problems. They all have some improvements. And uh, this is not the, the case for all the, the studies that we were able to extract. Uh, organizational interventions seem to be addressing some of the gaps in the care of seniors. For seniors. Now, if we uh, look at each of the important health care outcomes, we could start with quality of life. So this was the indicator most valued by participants in the interview because it's patient-centered, it ensures meeting the patient's goal of care. So these are uh, the things that people told us about this indicator. In the review, we found three preventive interventions to improve quality of life over the 22. So only, only three. One was an exercise program, the other one was a fall prevention program, and the other one was a collaborative care program with, with referral to community resources. So there are the, there really is a limited number of experimental studies targeting quality of life, only four over 22. This is surprising considering it's the most valued. Uh, there are measurement issues with this uh, outcome. Uh, also, well, I think we can ask ourselves, are the healthcare services and research well aligned with patient goals? I'm not sure they are at the moment. So the experimental studies that targeted quality of life, you have the four studies here, all had an impact, a positive impact on quality of life except one. So one was a small group physical exercise program, other one was an, an inspectorial interdisciplinary team approach to fall prevention, other one was a mobility intervention in long-term care facilities. And uh, you have the, the assessment, the, the, the third one was not effective, and the video study again here. The provider competencies or skills, it was the indicator 
second most valued by a participant. They said that uh, they found it was important because it was directly connected to care, and there were gaps. There are gaps to be filled in this area. There was a single, only one experimental study uh, tried to improve this provider competencies or skill. Why? Uh, well, I think there are challenges to design and evaluate educational interventions. Uh, it's also more difficult to fund the uh, studies on uh, targeting ed educational intervention. I would know because I'm a researcher in medical education. <laughs> so um, there are challenges in me measuring significant impact of such in interventions on the patient's health. It's always uh, improvement in knowledge, improvement in, in you know, competencies feel very specific, but you don't always have impacts on patient important outcomes. So more difficult to find. So this is the study here that uh, had uh, an impact on this indicator, the video study, an inter interdisciplinary multifaceted knowledge translation intervention within long-term care. For symptoms now, it's valued by a uh, case stakeholder because uh, they say the symptoms influence patient autonomy and quality of life. So we, we go back again to quality of life. Also, it's important because it may be underreported by patient. The review, in the review, we found, we found only two reports that evaluated the impact of an intervention to reduce symptoms, and none had any uh, significant positive impact. So you see uh, the two are described here. A multifactorial interdisciplinary team approach to fall prevention and Nordic walking. So I'm going to try to uh, go a bit faster. So the caregiver burden was valued because it indicates the sustainability of frail senior care. And any limitation of the caregiver becomes a barrier for frail senior health care in general. So caregiver is really important. Only one uh, experimental study in, tried to improve burden. It was the PRISMA study uh, in Quebec. And it didn't show a, an improvement. It showed that it worsened uh, this, this indicator, so an increase in burden. If we look at the, um, so now we're going to move to the, the second, the third question, which is outcomes across frail senior cohorts. So to put it in other words, we want to know what that, are there some uh, differences in important indicators of health in frail seniors across different spectrum of senior frail seniors. In the scoping review, we found no results uh, to this regarding this question for the four important outcomes. We have uh, results, however, for other indicators. But uh, as I told you, I, I decided to focus on this one here, on these one, these four ones. For the interviews, we, we did ask a specific question to the stakeholders about what influence, influences, uh, what would influence, uh, what aspect of the frail senior or characteristic of the frail senior could influence their indicators or their quality of care. We found they gave us no information about what could influence quality of life, symptoms, or caregiver burden. They only uh, discussed that um, provider competency or skills are very uh, difficult. Well, interviews suggest that providers are less competent to care for frail seniors presenting mental problems such as dementia, depression, depression or delirium. Now, for administrative data, uh, we checked the association between the indicators that we extracted and province, age, sex, and community size, and socioeconomic status. So here we have, uh, as I told you, we're not supposed to compare provinces. So I just want to show you that uh, here you have a cohort of frail senior who had died at time of analysis. We also have results for a cohort of frail seniors who had not died at time of analysis. I'm not presenting this here. So you have 
results for the five provinces for our uh, important, some of the important uh, indicators. We have more indicators than that in the report. First, I want to point out that it's very reassuring to see that there are, the, the indicators are of the same order of magnitude, so we're not all over the place, so they're, um, they're very consistent across provinces. But, uh, so for example, for inpatient days, you have 19, 19 inpatient days in Nova Scotia during the last year of life. And it, it goes from 19 to, 12, uh, to 11 in Ontario. For ED visit, it goes from 2 to 4. For emergency department visit in the last year of life. For continuity of care, we can measure it in, in some provinces. It goes from point nine. So it's an index, index of uh, 0 to 1. It goes from 0 0.9 to 1 in Ontario. And in, for ICU, the proportion of seniors who had at least one ICU admission in the last 30 days of life, you see it goes from 3 to 16 percent, so there's wide variations. But as I said, I, I'm just describing this, but uh, we shouldn't compare because they're not the same cohorts, right? So readmission goes from uh, 46 to 51 uh, percent. 54%. And the proportion of uh, people who have experience in basic ventilation, so this is what the, we, we had said to measure non-beneficial interventions, and this is the only one that we found that we could, uh, we decided to measure only this kind of non-beneficial intervention. This one was consensual among the researchers that it was a good indicator. And um, so you see it goes from 1% to 15% in Nova Scotia. So I, I just remember that uh, in Nova Scotia, this was a cohort of people who had died of cancer. So they're slightly different. So if we check uh, across frail senior cohort, the difference due to, well, the indicator of care in different age group, we see that frail senior that are older were less likely than those younger to have inpatient stay, spend time in hospital, visit the emergency department, have an intensive care unit visit, have seven days and 30 days readmission after a first admission, have invasive ventilation. So overall, they have less contact with the healthcare system. And this association, these associations, sorry, there is an S missing, were consistent across provinces. We also find found that sex, uh, there was a uh, consistent association related to sex across provinces. So males were more likely than females to have an inpatient state, spend more days in the hospital, visit the emergency department, have an intensive care unit admission, have seven day and 30 day readmissions, have invasive ventilation, and overall, so they had more contact with the healthcare system. This is consistent with other uh, studies as well that report uh, more uh, and difficult uh, situation of males related to females. Community size, we found significant associations, but it was inconsistent across provinces. And you know, I want I just wanted to show you how we created this kind of results. So it was much more challenging to interpret. And uh, this is probably due to the related to relate to the rural urban character of each province. Some provinces have more rural uh, communities that are more urban. So you see uh, the kind of uh, results that we get here. As I'm not going to go through all of this, but you see, for example, just the first line, emergency department visit in the last year of life. You see in Ontario, BC, and Alberta, we have um, uh, uh, people living in larger community having less emergency department visits. In Quebec and Nova Scotia, we couldn't uh, measure it. For uh, but there, for inpatient days, you see it's uh, or maybe so for continuity of care, you see there's a difference between provinces. If we check income now, we see also it's inconsistent across across provinces. The trend is that frail seniors with higher income will have fewer inpatient days, fewer days in the hospital, fewer visits to the emergency department, 
fewer intensive care unit admissions or inpatient admissions, and they are less likely to receive invasive ventilation. So in summary, higher quality of care for those with higher income. So I'm going to end now the, the presentation. Uh, I'm not going to make any uh, general conclusion, maybe just to say, and, and I'm going to make a general conclusion, but it's not in the slides. <laughs> so uh, what, what strikes me in this scan that, you know, we, don't, we didn't have the results for such a long time, but uh, it strikes me that uh, some indicators that are very important to people are not measured, are not studied. Uh, caregiver burden and caregiver in general are not uh, very much targeted in, in any way. And quality of life and provider competencies or skills. So for me as a researcher, it's really informative to have this scan results to, to support the, the future work that I will be doing. So potential new research avenues also, uh, I'm just going to list them here. Maybe this will be useful for some of you. So I think it would be useful to create a list of additional non-beneficial intervention to be extracted from administrative databases. This could be done fairly easy. Uh, using a consensus panel, and, and, and then we would have these very, very sensitive uh, indicators of care. Now, we only used invasive ventilation during the 14 days of life and 30, four days of the 30 last days of life. I think it would be good to find ways to identify frail seniors living in long-term care facilities from an administrative databases in all provinces. We also uh, should improve our knowledge base on interventions that improve informal caregiver outcomes. We should develop knowledge translation interventions that target decision makers. There was no uh, included studies about decision makers. We should also find what are the specific problems of frail senior who are also part of minority groups, so people uh, with, from other cultures, we should also validate a robust algorithm to identify frail seniors. Uh, it would be also interesting to validate the identification rule against, that we used in the study against a clinical sample of frail seniors. And this is something that I would like to do maybe here, uh, or I would like to support people doing if you're interested. And I would like to know also, I think we should also find what the best practices are worldwide to care for frail seniors. So I hope, um, my accent was not too disturbing <laughs> and that you appreciated the, the, the information. So I will be very uh, pleased to answer any questions on, on the email or uh, on the, uh, in, during the webinar here. So Thank it's, you. Uh, okay. Um, that was a very informative presentation and a lot of information to absorb. And I guess one of the questions that comes up, and you've, you've stated it a few times in your presentation, is why is it impossible to compare the indicators you have extracted from the administrative databases across the provinces? I know you said Nova Scotia particularly is just cancer, so I get that. But what, what, what about the other three provinces? Yes, so uh, of course uh, I'm not the... Um, uh, data analyst, but uh, the data, data analysts in the team were really, really uh, uh, persistent in, <laughs> in that we wouldn't uh, compare provinces. It's very easy to do because the data is really comparable. It looks like it's comparable. So I'm, I'm glad that you're asking the question. So uh, you saw in the different cohorts uh, that were extracted, that there were differences in these cohorts. Some were identified because they were long-term care residents, and some were identified because um, they had, uh, for example, they were um, uh, end of life. So these two types of seniors don't have the same, they don't receive at all the same services. If we had the same proportion in the cohorts in Quebec and in Ontario, and so then it would be more easier to compare them or more uh, doable to compare them, but uh, because the, the cores differ so much, and this is due to the way the data is being entered, even at the level of the healthcare provider, some will enter, so it's practice, some, some it's standard practice to enter the nutritional issue, some won't have this practice as well implemented in their, in their clinics, 
So this, these are all the reasons. So yes, I hope I am mentoring good enough. I think so. Uh, here's another question and, and equally important. Um, oops, I just lost them. That was good. Um, inter oh, sorry. Can you discuss the reasons why there are so few studies of interventions targeting improvement in the quality of life of frail seniors? Uh, well, I, I've, I've been trying to find a, a quality of life uh, measure that would be very, uh, very uh, sensitive to uh, changes uh, and for my own studies. And uh, I've had some difficulties finding this perfect measure. So, and it's a complex, uh, uh, con there's several constructs inside the quality of life. So I guess this is one reason. Sometimes it's not always labeled quality of life. But we also checked other uh, ways people could label this aspect. And, and it was equally rare, <laughs> even when it was labeled as distress or uh, whichever other way that people could uh, use or describe quality of life. So measurement is certainly an issue. But I think it's also because this system of care is just uh, focusing more on uh, treating and uh, improving specific care outcomes instead of really focusing on what's important to people. And I think this is something that is changing. The palliative approach to care for frail seniors is going to, I, I'm confident that it's, it's something that's going to be uh, implemented in, in the next years, but uh, I think the mentalities are changing very slowly and people are really trying, are, are really still focusing on, on a specific health issues instead of focusing on, on more patient important outcomes. Yeah, you might be right. And I just recently, or I guess this week, we're in a process of doing the citizen engagement priority setting uh, process. And I think that will help to identify what is important to this group, because this group is the one that's growing the most. Um, so maybe we'll find some more insightful uh, information that will start you know, directing research in you know, the areas that are most important to them. I um, have some other questions. Um, it, it, one of the questions is, is thanking you for your interesting presentation, but further to that is, did you access the full article or just the abstracts of the selected studies during your scoping process? No, we did a standard uh, systematic review process, so it was, uh, it was scoping because we didn't focus only on interventions or it was more broad, but when, once we, got, we had our end on a paper, we extracted it uh, with the standard extraction uh, form, and we appraised that. No, we didn't appraise the quality, so this is one uh, thing that we didn't do. But we extracted the, the numbers, the, the significance of uh, effect, the, the, and um, we, re we report, we, we extracted whether the, the changes were significant, so it's more like a vote counting approach. And, um, yeah, so we extracted many, many, yes, many information from each of the reports. Okay. Here's a, a question that might take me a minute to actually ask it. It's, it's quite long, but a good one. When comparison between, when comparisons between provinces or cohorts present challenges, is it important to remember the potential challenges of comparing both concepts of seniors and frailty across cultures. So knowledge translation is critical as much as provider education in dealing with social cultural determinants of the topic. So I see this. Are you done? Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> 
Well, I don't think I have an answer. We can, <laughs> we could, I can discuss it, uh, but uh, I, I didn't see so much a difference between provinces as to the challenges of uh, pointing to a, a specific court of Bell Senior, except that in maybe in BC, <clears throat> and I'm not sure I'm answering you. You can uh, tell me, but uh, in BC there were more cultural diversity. Uh, but uh, so for extracting the data, when we extract the data, this aspect is not influencing extraction. No, so so I don't think for administrative data work we need to we have to take into account these specificities. I think it's more maybe uh, when we did the interviews that we would have we would take care to. Uh, to represent these groups that are diverse. So we had a lot of challenges recruiting. So we couldn't uh, say, OK, we're going to sample uh, people with cultural diversity. Uh, we just took it. It was a convenient sample, and we included everybody that we could find. So uh, I'm not sure I answered very well. Is there any feedback from the person? No, not so far, but um, stay tuned. Maybe they'll um, ask you a further question. Um, here's another one. Recognizing that heart failure increases with age, are there frailty and heart failure, failure data available for further analysis? OK, so we didn't extract any information about heart failure, but I think it would be uh, with our method. So I'm sorry that we didn't extract this. Heart failure didn't come out as an important indicator, so we didn't extract in the population the proportion, for example, of people who would have had heart failure. We didn't use it either as an indicator of frailty. We didn't use it to, um, Heart failure was not used as a way to identify frail seniors because it was not specific enough. A lot of people have heart failure are not frail. So I think from the cohort that we have, we could check whether uh, these seniors have more heart failures than the general population. But this would need, it would need to be another extraction, another study. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, here's another question. Interventions to improve the coordination of care seem effective to improve patient important outcomes. Is there one organizational intervention that should be scaled up among those that you reviewed? Actually, um, there was one that was performed. Well, I think there are two studies, not only that they, they were a coordination of care intervention, but uh, that showed positive impact. But also they studied uh, the cost effectiveness, and they, were, they had very, very good uh, figures for that. So one was conducted in, um, in Hamilton, but I don't remember on the top of my head the, the, the reference. And uh, it seemed very promising. It was a, a care coordination model where the there was a navigator with who had access to a team that could go to home. So it was an, uh, a home care uh, follow-up team. And uh, it was very, uh, it seemed very promising. So this is the kind of, uh, of uh, intervention that I would see scaled up at once uh, because uh, it was effective, it was cost effective, and it seemed to really target patient important outcomes. So I'm sorry I don't have the name of the researcher on the top of my mind. It's coming back up. Annie, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, I think we just lost audio, audio on our end. So, uh, 
So I think that was almost the end of the questions. But one of uh, the uh, people that answered a question previously uh, just let us know that 70% of uh, the literature says, uh, or the literature says that 70% uh, of people with, uh, or seniors with frail, or with heart failure um, are frail. So um, they were probably included in your group, it's just that they weren't identified. And because frail encompasses so many things, I think that's why it's so unique. Um, you know, it's not disease specific, it's, it's a lot harder to study, it's more complex, and so your study itself, is, it's, it's hard to actually um, look at the um, specifics of, of why a person is frail. You've just identified that they are frail. Um, I, I see, I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions, because um, my machine went down for some reason. I am in an old building, so sometimes that happens. Um, I don't think there's any more questions that I see that, other than people saying thank you for your presentation. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say before we sign off? Uh, yes, no, well, thank you for this last comment. Uh, I believe that uh, it's true that uh, some diseases are more specific to frail seniors, but uh, we couldn't rely on them because they were not specific enough. We wanted really to try to remove the noise. Also, we wanted not to use a few, only a few diseases that would have maybe bias our sample towards one group or the other. So. Uh, at first, we had thought that we would use diseases or uh, diagnosis codes to, uh, to make uh, our sample, to create our sample. But then it would have been very, very, very large work, and we would have probably biased our sample towards one group or the other. So I think the, the codes that we use are useful and could be, uh, yeah, so used to study whatever heart failure, um, the proportions of heart failures into this group. So it would be interesting to confirm the, the literature that you have uh, brought. So just uh, nothing else to say. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, it was a pleasure to present. Thank you, Unique. You've got a lot of comments saying that they appreciated your comments today and your great presentation. So, um, and thanks to everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, I hope that all of you can join our next webinar on June 15th, and our webinar schedule is posted on our website. And again, we do get a lot of questions asking if the uh, if your presentation will be posted, and yes, it will be posted in the next couple of days, and you can see on the slide where it will be posted, and the webinar will be there as well, um, just in a couple of days. So, so thanks everyone for joining today, and thank you, Anique and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.